Greetings, everyone, and welcome to Theology 621, Lecture 11b, where we're going to look up at Jesus' eschatological vision. And as much as we attend to questions of the historical Jesus, we will really be looking at the ways that the, the four Gospels in the New Testament deal with questions of Jesus' teaching about eschatology. We open with the sort of quotation that makes this a difficult topic. This is recorded in all three synoptic gospels, Jesus promising to those followers with him that some of them standing there would not taste death until they saw the kingdom of God come with power. Did that happen? Was that promise fulfilled? Well, that's something that early Christians and early opponents of Christianity certainly worried about. There was a New York Times story a few months ago that was distinguishing the most common Google searches in the most depressed parts of the United States and the searches in the most prosperous parts of the, of the United States to demonstrate what a striking disparity there was in the sorts of things people looked for. The relevance of this uh, to the question of eschatology is that you'll see in the prosperous parts of the US the expected things, people are looking for iPads and good cameras and baby joggers and so on. And in the most depressed parts of the US, what are people asking about? The Antichrist the rapture, hell. Of course, somewhat depressingly, they're also asking about severe itching and lupus syndrome and so on and so forth. But be that as it may, this remains uh, not only the interest of those who are uh, hard up. Uh, not too long ago in Perth, I overheard a set of ladies sipping white wine in a restaurant and having an elaborate conversation about the second coming and the rapture. And if we think about some of these topics that we associate with eschatology, some of them are not talked about in the Gospels. And in fact, something like the millennium is something discussed only in the book of Revelation, chapter 20. Here's a picture of our author of the book of Revelation, the seer John, on the island of Patmos. The word antichrist never occurs except in the epistles of John. And there it's used in the plural. There are many antichrists. It's not worried about some cosmic figure. It's talking about people who have a bad attitude and a misunderstanding about the gospel. But some of these topics are talked about by Jesus. In fact, his second coming, his return. And uh, furthermore, Jesus talks about what we might call cosmic eschatology, not just personal eschatology. We're going to look at these passages from the gospels, but it's worth noting that we started the semester by describing broadly speaking, a couple of schools of historical Jesus scholars, and some think that Jesus was, above all, a wisdom teacher. And they will look at content that is highly eschatological, like the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light, and this will all happen in this generation. That's from Mark chapter 13 and Matthew chapter 24. And their take on this sort of eschatological fire and brimstone, doom and gloom, it's all going to happen, uh, all sorts of retribution will be paid out upon the earth. They look at that and they say, Jesus never said it. That has nothing to do with the historical Jesus. That's stuff that Jesus' followers invented. They have to tell some sort of story about why the followers invented it, and they'll usually say that, I don't know, actually they were disappointed that the mission didn't go well or something like that. It's a bit of a desperate stretch, and I think this has been I think everyone would acknowledge kind of one of the most challenging aspects for the people who take this sort of portrait of Jesus is they have a tough time making sense of the sheer abundance of eschatological material. And furthermore, something I'll speak about in a, in a moment, the fact that the eschatological material can't just be cut away with scissors and, and, and have everything else still be intact. Because some of what Jesus teaches some of his ethical teachings, some of what he's up to, what he does, is pretty intricately connected to these predictions about what's going to happen and what's going to happen soon. So what about this other school of thought who say Jesus is an apocalyptic prophet? I named Sanders and Ehrman and Dale Allison Jr. We've read some of them already at this point in the semester. I add here N.T. Wright, uh, a very important and, and well-known scholar of historical Jesus, among other things, they're all going to agree that, yes, Jesus said this sort of thing, and it was central to his message. But here we want to make 
sort of one important early observation that they disagree, at least some of them disagree with each other, about what they think this sort of language meant. And I just want to introduce this as a category at the outset, because folks like Ehrman and N.T. Wright would be kind of on opposite ends of, well, they'd be opposite ends on several spectrums, but they would both agree Jesus talked a lot about this stuff, the real historical Jesus did, and that it was central to what he was doing and what he was teaching. But, and I'm, I'm not doing full justice to the nuances of these guys' positions here, but someone like N.T. Wright would say, when Jesus used this apocalyptic language, he was using imagery, well-known apocalyptic imagery drawn from the prophets and from things like the book of Daniel and from intertestamental apocalypses to apply them or to speak about quite mundane, down-to-earth political and spiritual events. Of course, the political and the spiritual can't be divided in the ancient world. So, long story short here, N.T. Wright would be saying something like this. When Jesus says, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light, it is a way of saying there is going to be a cataclysmic change in the life of our people, Israel, something like that. And one of the, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not accusing Wright of, of, of taking this interpretation just so that he gets Jesus to be correct, but one of the results of saying, if you say that that's what Jesus meant by this language, he can be correct. Because it is true that within 30 some years of Jesus speaking this way, something politically cataclysmic did happen to the people standing there. Namely, the Romans came in and destroyed the temple and tore down every stone. And, and, and the Christian community began and so on and so forth. So you might apply various parts of Jesus' eschatological teaching to those different events. Kind of one way to think about this would be like saying, if, if I said an election is coming soon and I predict that hell will freeze over. I could say that without having any real commitment to the ontological reality of hell and not making any actual meteorological prediction, predictions about the weather in hell. I'm just saying there's an election coming and it's going to be a really big surprise. Something like that, right? Airman on the other side, another guy who thinks Jesus is best understood as an apocalyptic prophet, he wants to say, no, Jesus was really predicting a fire and brimstone cataclysmic into the visible universe. That's the plain meaning of those words. He predicted it. That's what people expected. And it didn't happen. Therefore, Jesus is wrong. And for Ehrman, that's going to be the reason that the subsequent generations, including authors like Luke and John, importantly, he thinks they're already trying to do damage control, to just put it bluntly. They've got these sayings. They still believe in Jesus. And so what are they going to do with a saying that says this will happen before this generation passes away? Well, you might massage the, the message a little bit and say, well, he was talking about the spiritual life that's available to us here and now, or the kingdom that's already an inner reality in some sense, not an external kingdom that could be seen visibly. I want to start with some categories from Jesus eschatology and from biblical eschatology more broadly. And because there's some really confusing stuff in eschatological teachings, it's worth emphasizing some things that are relatively clear. A central concept that runs throughout the Bible, and indeed that runs throughout a lot of ancient Near Eastern literature more broadly, even Greco-Roman literature to some extent, is the idea that the end will resemble the beginning. So quite often, myths about the primal state of things, about an ancient golden age, are very tightly connected to notions about what the end state is or ought to be or will be. You certainly see this in scripture, and you have Jesus even giving uh, ethical teachings based on what seems to be his belief that the state of the beginning is meant to be recaptured by his community because the end has, has come. So for instance, here I quote from Matthew 19, they're asking, is it permissible to divorce and remarry? And he says, well, it's true that Moses said you could, but that was sort of a condescension on God's part to the fragile human state. From the beginning, it was not so. The striking thing is that Jesus suggests that the way it was in the beginning is how it ought to be for his followers, which implies because the end has come, the ethics of the beginning are reinstated. So keep an eye for that. We won't be able to talk about every example, but 
the idea of beginning and end is important, and it's sort of theologically important. Uh, there's a notion of personal eschatology, namely not what will happen to the cosmos in some cataclysmic culmination, but what happens to a person when that person dies. And obviously the day of one's death is not known. This is a truism that has always been observed. Jesus certainly draws implications from that. So a quote here from Luke 12 tells the parable of a foolish rich person who stores stuff up in their barn, congratulates themselves on having uh, laid up a nice nest egg, and says, you fool, tonight your life is demanded. What good will that do? You have no idea the day of your own death. And Jesus makes quite a lot of the fact that you will die, and relatedly, there will be a post-mortem judgment. So this, in certain strands of Christian and Jewish sort of modern interpretation, is not very popular, but there's no denying it's utterly prevalent throughout the Gospels. Jesus says he will come back as the Son of Man to pay back everyone according to their deeds. People will give an account even for every idle word they said. Um, in Matthew 25, you get this image of the goats and the sheep, and everyone is paid back according to what they've done. And clearly the implication is that there will be a post-mortem judgment is supposed to change how you live in the here and now. Um, and, and again, this isn't unique to ancient Jewish or Christian thinking. Greeks and Romans, although they had a lot of different ideas about the afterlife and they can't be systematized, there's still some sense that there will be a post-mortem setting things right, already in, in Plato's myth of Ur, and, and way back in Greek and Roman history, among the most distinguished philosophers, they all agree, somehow, the injustices of this world will get set right in the next. And another sort of overarching theme, this may be a little bit more owing to Jeremy's own interpretive lens than what's plainly there on the surface of the text, but I just put this forward, I think it's a useful category, is the idea that not only will justice be done because there will be post-mortem judgments, but that on a cosmic scale, there will be some conclusion, whether it's the new heavens and the new earth, or a millennial reign, or the lion lying down with the lamb, as Isaiah has it, that, that, that the culmination is, is not simply writing past wrongs, it's like a final chapter of a book that makes the previous chapters make more sense. We all know the experience of reading something and then getting to a final chapter that, that has new discoveries that makes us go and reflect newly on what the plot up to that point actually meant. And we realize, oh, that person, oh, it looks a little different now that I know the end of the story. And I think there's a sense in biblical eschatology at its best that the final chapter, which is not yet made clear, but is sort of promised, there will be a final chapter that will make sense of what went before. To quote something not from the Bible, but from a text from this period, a Jewish apocalypse called Second Baruch, if the end of all things had not been prepared, their beginning would have been senseless. And perhaps in a slightly different way, you could think of the book of Revelation saying that in the end, God will wipe away every tear. And as the novelist uh, Marilyn Robinson has said, uh, that will be required. And she says that in the sense that somehow the tears have got to make more sense. They not only need to be wiped away, but there needs to be some, some culmination of the story that means they were worthwhile and not just meaningless suffering. All right, I think I'm preaching here and not teaching, so we'll move on. Those things, I think, are relatively clear. There's a lot of things that are not clear, and not clear for every reason. We're going to look at some of these in more detail. There are, of course, lots of predictions, in one form or another, of either a quick culmination of, of, of the whole cosmos. All these things will happen in this generation. So says Jesus in Mark 13, Matthew 24, Luke 21. And what are all these things that are going to happen in this generation? Well, they seem to include the sun going dark and the moon not giving its light and uh, abominations of desolation and all sorts of cosmic mayhem, the, the, the powers in heaven being shaken and so on and so forth. Why is that not so easy? Well, first of all, it didn't, didn't happen in any obvious way. Secondly, it's not always clear what he's talking about. Sometimes it does seem symbolic, sometimes it seems literal. 
there is what seems to be clear promises of I am coming quickly. That's from the book Revelation, so that doesn't have to be our main problem in this lecture. Antichrist, imagery, beasts, and woes. This is mostly a problem from the book Revelation, as is the millennium. And I just mentioned because these are the things that are sort of popularly discussed. Millennium and rapture. What are these? Well, the rapture is, is something only Paul talks about in Thessalonians. It's not discussed in the book Revelation. The millennium is something only the book Revelation talks about. It's not talked about by Paul or in the Gospels. So those, blessedly, in this lecture are not our problem. I think another, one more sort of lens through which we could ask about Jesus' eschatology in particular is to say, how integral are the eschatological components, whether they're personal, what happens to an individual when they die, or whether they're cosmic, how soon will the cosmos be changed or dissolved or destroyed or whatever? How integral are those things to other content? And here's basically what I mean. There's a sense in which a teaching of Jesus like love thy neighbor as thyself is more or less unaffected by whether or not you, know, you rightly understand what the numerical value of the Antichrist's name is, right? And regardless of what one's understanding of um, how exactly Jesus' return did or didn't happen in the, in the time that was promised, love thy neighbor more or less would still be unaffected. But there are, I think, and here's where it's more problematic, there are, there's a good amount of Jesus' teaching that is more integrally connected to what it seems to be his eschatological understanding. So simply to refer to an item already mentioned, his explanation for his teaching on not permitting divorce and remarriage is directly connected to his, his, his claim that the way it was in the beginning is how it should be again now. And to take an even more striking example from the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians 7, when Paul is addressing the question whether it's permissible or profitable to marry at all, he says, no, it's really better not to. And he's quite explicit about why. It's better not to because the time is short, because the shape of this world is passing away. In that sort of piece of advice, you, you can't separate the moral, it's better not to marry, from the eschatological scenario. The shape of this world is passing away, the time is drawn short. If you're wrong about the time drawing short, you'd probably give a different piece of advice. And to come back to Jesus and the Gospels, quite a lot of his teaching is just directly related to an eschatological scenario. So people don't talk a lot about this now, but he's going on quite a lot in the Gospels about saying things like, pray that it, this cataclysm, not happen in winter or on the Sabbath. And he's giving instructions about when to flee for Ju when to flee for the hills and when not to flee for the hills. Obviously, those things can't make any sense apart from some sort of eschatological scenario. All right, so much for prolegomena, and and hopefully a bit of explication. Let's delve into some of the teachings and some of the ways the different gospels are shaping Jesus' teaching about eschatology. The classic. Uh, section of teaching is what is found in Mark 13, Matthew 24, Luke 21, usually called the little apocalypse because it's sort of like an apocalypse. It's framed as a revelation. It deals with end times things. And I want to start by comparing Mark and Matthew and noting some differences. Mark and Matthew, if you look at them in your, in your synopsis of the Gospels, or if you just look at Mark 13 and then Matthew 24, you will see that they're very, very similar. Um, the sun will go dark, the moon will not give its light. There will be uh, an abomination that makes desolate. Let the reader understand. All these things are almost verbatim in both chapters. And Jesus give these, gives this content in answer to a question from the disciples. In the Gospel of Mark, this is the narrative setting for that answer. Jesus came out of the temple, we're in Jerusalem, and it's a, then we get a question about the temple. 
The disciples say, teacher, look at what large stones and what large buildings. Jesus responds to that comment by saying, not one stone will be left upon another. They then ask, when will this be? This refers to one stone, not one stone being left on another. What's the sign that these things are about to be accomplished? That means that all the rest of Mark 13 is ostensibly an answer to a question from the disciples, when will this happen? Namely, when will the temple be destroyed? Before saying more about Mark, let's just look at what Matthew does with that, because Matthew 24 has all the same content as Mark 13, but he slightly changes what the question is. Jesus comes out of the temple. There's a question about the buildings. Not one stone will be left upon another. They say, well, when will this be? And what will be the sign of your coming? In Greek, your parousia. That's the technical term for the second coming. And of the end of the age. In other words, in Matthew 24, the same content, the same quotes from Jesus, are an answer to a different question. Not merely now a question about when will the temple be destroyed, but now a question about when will Jesus return and what will be the end of the age. This is really striking because if the hypothesis is right that Matthew is written after the Gospel of Mark, and if it's right that Matthew is written even after the destruction of the temple, then Matthew will have taken all this, this little apocalypse from Mark 13 and essentially will have made it more difficult. Here's what I mean. Jesus didn't return by the time the temple was destroyed. The temple was destroyed in AD 70. Jesus didn't come back. In Mark, you kind of have a pass, because although Mark 13 does sure sound like it's talking about signs in the heavens on the earth, it's possible to read Mark 13 along the lines of N.T. Wright and say, well, this is just really dramatic symbolic language for saying, the temple will be destroyed, Jerusalem and our religion as we know it will be dramatically transformed. And Jesus will be saying then, all this will happen um, in your generation. Well, it did happen in their generation. But you can't really read Matthew 24 that same way. Because now all of those same scenarios, there'll be wars and rumors of wars and so on and so forth, all that stuff is supposed to be the sign of Jesus coming and the end of the age. And neither of those things happened by the time the temple was destroyed. I don't have a solution for this, and I don't really know why Matthew would, if Matthew is changing Mark, why would Matthew change Mark in this way and create a more difficult problem for himself? I believe we mentioned before that Matthew then, in a rather orderly way, uh, repeats again and again a, a simple set of points. Namely, that you have to be ready. And why do you have to be ready? Because there's an ignorance about the exact time. About that day and that hour, no one knows, not even the Son, only the Father. A remarkable passage that created certain Christological problems for the Church Fathers because they didn't, weren't crazy about the idea of the Son confessing ignorance of the time of the end. And then lots of illustrations of this. So it'll be just like it was in the days of Noah. Uh, you, you won't know when it's going to happen. One day the rains just start falling, and that's the end. There'll be two women grinding meal together. One will be taken and one will be left. Keep awake, for you don't know on what day your Lord is coming. Question to ask here, one will be taken and one will be left. Who gets the good portion? Is it the one who is taken, i.e. taken up to heaven? Or is the idea that when the Lord comes, the Lord is coming to earth, therefore the good thing is to be left, to be there with the Lord, and it's the one who's taken away who misses out. Hard to say. And finally, there are parables of delay, so there's a bad servant who starts getting drunk and beating the other servants, and that's bad, bad news for him. And the one more famous one is the parable of the ten virgins. Five have enough oil, five don't. All of them became drowsy and fell asleep. And somewhat incongruously, Matthew provides them the conclusion, therefore keep awake, for you don't know the day or the hour. But keep awake isn't exactly quite the right conclusion for that parable because everyone fell asleep in that parable. So maybe what he meant to say is 
Therefore, take plenty of oil with you because you don't know the day or the hour and you need to have your lamp burning. Anyway, we come now to think about Luke and eschatology. If Matthew's main points are clear, there will be a judgment, everyone will be paid back according to their deeds. You don't know. The main thing Matthew wants to say is you don't know when. What about Luke, where we have a second volume from Luke? And as it has been provocatively put by one of the foremost New Testament scholars of the 20th century, you don't write a history of the church, that is the book of Acts, if you're expecting the end of the world to come any day. Well, that's kind of a good point, and it might strike us as intuitive. Uh, why would you write a history of the church and talk about who the leaders were and how they sorted out some policies and so on and how they're getting on in the world and, and, and so on and so forth if you think any day now the Lord's coming back and meanwhile we're just biding our time. Um, so what does Luke do in his gospel as the inheritor of a lot of difficult eschatological sayings that imply the Lord is coming back any day now and the world might end any day now? Well, one thing Luke does is he, he just simply omits a lot of difficult passages. So, to give some examples, things that Luke doesn't have. Both Matthew and Mark say, the gospel must be preached to all the nations, and then the end. For what it's worth, one of the earliest critics of Christianity, Porphyry the philosopher, he seized upon this very passage and taunted the Christians and said, folks, Christianity has been preached in every nation now. Everyone around the world has heard about Christianity at this point. The end hasn't come. What gives? Well, perhaps Luke foresaw that that was going to be a, a, maybe a bit too predictive and going to get them in trouble. Luke leaves it out. Matthew and Mark have a prediction that false Christs will give signs and maybe even deceive the elect. That seems to call into question what the word elect means. Luke leaves it out. Matthew and Mark have a saying, unless the Lord had shortened those days, no flesh would be saved. Luke leaves it out. And this statement about not even the sun knowing the day or the hour, Luke leaves it out. And in fact, it's possible to read Luke as doing a sort of thorough rewriting to make a more... Uh, almost a more rational version of eschatology. So he emphasizes there's going to be some dumb servants. He gives a parable. There's going to be some dumb slave who says, oh, my Lord's taking a long time to come back. And Luke's attitude is, that's, that's silly. Luke tells within his narrative unique episodes, for instance, people thinking the kingdom was going to appear instantly. And he has Jesus tell a parable to say, no, that's, that's dumb. It's not like that. Likewise, just one more example of Luke arguably doing some editorial work to uh, alleviate or, or address some of the hard passages. Take, for instance, arguably the hardest passage, the prediction that this generation will not pass away until all these things have taken place. Wars and rumors of wars, the abomination of desolations, the sun going black, the stars being shaken and falling from the sky. Luke changes that and says this generation will not pass away until all things have taken place. He doesn't say all these things. So now the promise that all things will take place doesn't refer back to all these eschatological events. It becomes almost like a tautology that's uh, not susceptible to being falsified. Well, all things, all necessary things will take place. What takes place will have been the things that had to take place. You can see that it's possible to read Luke as if, to take Kazeman's hypothesis, Luke's writing late in this first century, he knows the temple's been destroyed, he knows the Lord didn't come back quickly, he knows it's time to set up some institutions and get on with the work, and so he's, he's almost embarrassed by these sayings, and he starts to uh, lessen their heightened awareness, their heightened expectation. Perhaps the locus classicus for this idea would be Luke 17. When Jesus is asked, when is the kingdom of God coming? He says, it doesn't come with watching. So don't look for signs, fools. And they don't say, behold, it's here or there. The kingdom of God is in your midst. And this could be interpreted uh, to say that all that is promised in the kingdom 
is not something that's going to come some future day in cataclysmic form. Rather, it is the presence of the loving and healing and forgiving and teaching Jesus. In even a slightly more maybe mystical version of this same saying, we can see a trajectory here, perhaps, from Luke to the Gospel of Thomas, where Thomas, which really doesn't have almost any eschatology at all, will take this same saying and say, the kingdom doesn't come by watching. Rather, the kingdom of the Father is already spread out on the earth, and people just don't see it. It's a present reality. You just need eyes to detect it. The kingdom of God is inside of you and outside of you. There's no eschatology in that at all. The kingdom is forever a reality, and the question is discovering it. I think this is one way to read Luke, that Luke is aware of the problem created by the eschatological predictions and is systematically rewriting them to make them less problematic. The thing is, Luke still has a heap of difficult sayings. So Luke also talks about seeing certain signs and knowing that the kingdom is near. Luke does r retain the notion that the kingdom is not simply a present reality to be discovered, but is something that is going to come and that can be detected if you know how, what signs to look for. And although he says the kingdom is in your midst, that's not the only thing he says about the kingdom. He also says that it will be like lightning seen from one end of the sky to the other. It will be unmistakable. It will be like the days of Noah, the same saying as in Matthew. It'll be sudden, you better be ready. In fact, Luke says, when it comes, don't turn back. Remember Lot's wife. Lot's wife, of course, who looked back and was turned into a pillar of salt. And Luke retains all these sayings about two being in one bed, one taken and one left. Two grinding mill, one taken and one left. And in this case, Luke even includes what strikes me as a truly cryptic comment. He tells that parable and the disciples say, where, Lord? When What you really expect them to say is, when, Lord? And Jesus' answer is just as strange as their question. Where the corpse is, there the vultures will gather. If any of you knows what that means, send me an email. I would like to know. To give one more example of where Luke clearly is offering an interpretive gloss, an interpretive rewriting on the material he inherits, we can look at parallel sayings where Matthew says, when you see the desolating sacrilege standing in the holy place, as was spoken by the prophet Daniel, let the reader understand, then those in Judea must flee to the mountains. Matthew predicts the desolating sacrilege, the abomination of desolations from Daniel 9, also from 1 Maccabees 1. He predicts that that will happen in the temple, and then you should get out of Dodge. Luke takes that and makes it less cryptic. It's no longer about a desolating sacrilege. It's nothing more about Daniel. He just says, when you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, then you know that desolation has come near. He keeps the word desolation, but he makes this very straightforward. In fact, almost the sort of thing anyone could figure out. When Jerusalem's surrounded by armies, then you know she's about to get destroyed. That, of course, did happen. Uh, Jerusalem was surrounded by armies and was destroyed, therefore Luke makes this teaching much less mysterious and more easier to understand. Finally, I'll just note that Luke retains the hardest sayings of all. This generation will not pass away till all things have happened. And sayings like, truly, there are some standing here who will not taste death until they see the kingdom of God. Luke also retains the bulk of the little, the little apocalypse from Mark 13. So, he rearranges it in some strange ways, but he says there'll be persecutions and death, and this will result for witness. And then, so this is actually material he described earlier, then there will be false warnings, political, natural, and supernatural turbulence. Don't run then, but then you'll see Jerusalem surrounded. Now you should run. Then you'll see really terrifying signs. Now lift up your head, redemption is near. And when you see the signs, the kingdom is near, and you don't need anyone to teach you because you'll be able to figure it out. If you feel like you're in a muddle about Luke's eschatology, 
then you've been following the thrust of my lecture. Ernst Kesemann's sort of tidy solution, you don't write a second volume, you don't write a history of the church if you're expecting the end of the world every day. It has some truth to it. Luke clearly isn't expecting things to end any day, but he faithfully retains even some of the hard sayings. In general, Luke wants to emphasize there was already a present availability of the kingdom in Jesus' ministry. In general, Luke wants to say that much of what Jesus was talking about was predicting the destruction of Jerusalem. But Luke keeps the sayings about signs in the heavens and things and stars falling and so on and so forth. And Luke keeps sayings that may have even been mysterious to him, like where the vulture is, where the corpse is, there the vultures will gather. There's a sense in which you could sort of draw a trajectory from Jesus' eschatology to looking at the earliest uh, reckonings with that in Paul and some of Paul's communities. And Paul already has his Thessalonian communities, some of whom are quitting their day jobs because they think the return of Christ is so imminent, and others of whom are saying things like, it's already happened, and the resurrection's already happened, and so on. So there's already really diverse ideas of how to make sense of Jesus' teaching about eschatology in, in the 40s and 50s. You have Mark including all these pretty bold, hard sayings that Jesus is coming back soon with very clear, unmistakable signs. Matthew retains almost all of these, although he adds or maintains the view that not even the son would know, and you better stay on your toes because you don't know when it's happening. It looks like we could draw a bit of a line from Luke to John to Thomas of people trying to emphasize the present reality of the kingdom and to de-emphasize that it's coming with signs that will be seen and witnessed in the heavens, and that it's a present spiritual or mystical reality to be enjoyed in the present. I say with Luke, we don't want to say that too much because Luke has many of these uh, timeline type sayings, but in the case of Thomas it's clear, and in the case of John it's pretty clear. So we just want to note with John in particular that John by and large, John speaks a lot about eternal life, and it ceases to even be something that happens to an individual after their death. It's something they already have. So Jesus says, I tell you, anyone who hears my words has eternal life. He has passed from death to life. The hour is coming and is now here. Sort of classic Johannine edition. It's already the case that people have life. The Father has life, the Son has life, and those who see and believe in the Son have life. Indeed, John gives a sort of counterintuitive definition of eternal life in chapter 17. This is eternal life. And he, you'd expect him to say, living forever with God in perfect harmony with the angels singing in the choir. No, he says, eternal life is to know, to know the one true God and the Christ whom God sent. That's, that's an unusual definition of eternal life. It's something that is available in this time and place as kind of a reality in the heavens already accessible now from below. And nothing that could happen or not happen in human history can touch that. At the same time, John in his kind of classic way doesn't totally jettison the more traditional Jewish and Christian understanding. So to just continue the dialogue in John chapter 5, where Jesus has been so emphatic that eternal life is already possessed, and you've passed from death to life, you don't enter into judgment. John loves to speak out of both sides of his mouth about these sorts of things, like turning a topic around from different angles. And he also says, the hour is also coming, and here he doesn't say it now is, the hour is coming, when people in their graves will hear the voice of the Son of Man and will come out, those who have done good to a resurrection of life, those who have done evil to a resurrection of judgment or condemnation. That could have just as easily been on the pages of Matthew or the pages of Mark or anywhere else. That's the standard expectation that judgment happens at the end. So John retains a little bit of the conventional eschatology, but much more often, John transmutes it, plays it in a different key, and speaks about eternal life as something that's already present.
And likewise is death, some sort of spiritual death is already present. This is mainly focused here on, on personal eschatology, but John does something similar with the second coming. I will not leave you orphaned. I am coming to you. Think of the words repeated again and again in the book of Revelation. Lo, I'm coming quickly. In what sense is Jesus coming? Well, because you will see me. Because I live, you will live. And he goes on. Those who keep my word, my Father will love them. And we will come to them and make our home with them. I'm going away and I'm coming to you. Within the Johannine universe, what does that mean? It doesn't mean he's coming with glory and the angelic hosts and lightning from one end of the skies to the other. In the Johannine framework, that means my father and I are coming in the form of the paraclete and we will make our home with you because we will dwell with you just as you dwell with us. We can't tie this all up with a bow, but I want to come back to these sort of broader questions about how integral are some of the types of eschatological teaching to what Jesus says and does. And I think there's different answers for different categories. So to take the personal eschatology, although this may be unpalatable in a post Immanuel Kant age, um, Jesus talks about judgment a lot and he makes it a motivation for good behavior. So Immanuel Kant will say it, it devalues an ethical activity if it's done because of fear of punishment or for the sake of reward. No one told Jesus that, and he clearly wasn't having that sort of attitude. So why should you not fear someone who can destroy your body, but fear God who can destroy both body and soul in hell for that very reason? And he appeals constantly to the promise of reward or the threat of punishment as motivation. So sort of personal postmortem judgment is pretty integral to his ethical teaching. Similarly, I think the notion that there had been a turn in the ages with, with John the Baptist. And the Law and the Prophets are up to John. And then something radically new has begun. There's no way to make sense of what Jesus is up to with calling 12, with teaching like he does, except for the fact that he thinks he had, his movement, him himself, he has inaugurated the inbreaking of the kingdom. You can see the different gospel writers wrestle with these teachings in different ways because undoubtedly by the time John is written, he knows that people are dead and that he has to deal with the fact that Jesus said, what is it to you if this person remains until I return? And in the case of John, in the case of the Gospel of Thomas, in some passages in the Gospel of Luke, you can see one way to make sense of Jesus' predictions of a second coming, of an imminent second coming, or to say, well, he has come. He's come in the form of the Spirit. The kingdom has come. It's already present, spread out around us to be witnessed and perceived and lived in. That may very well have been an element of Jesus' teaching, but it wasn't the only one, as Mark 13 and Matthew 24 attest. All right, I won't continue to blather on about how to try to uh, wrestle with all these things, but hopefully we've had a chance to look at some of the teachings about eschatology and the ways the four canonical gospels deal with them.